This is the Neobooks call on Monday, January 29th, 2024, a special day for my better half. Hey, Chris. Hey, Jose. Thanks for joining. I will turn on the captions as well. There we go. Cool. Um, I feel like it, we're sort of at a point where we can kind of restart this conversation in a sense. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe there's a level setting to do, and uh, then we can dive in to check in, like where are we on on this uh, on this journey? Yay! There's Pete. Jesse, I love your hand drawn avatar. Your stick figure avatar is really sweet. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I'm walking right now, so I think I'll be a distraction if I. Oh, no worries. You on. So uh, Wendy Elford is often walking uh, in the outback in uh, Australia when she calls into the uh, Free Jury's Brain Calls, which are at 1 p.m. today. She's often taking a, mo a morning stroll. And then sometimes um, Julian Gomez is walking in his backyard. We have a couple, we have a couple regular walkers, so. I should be walking outside. I'm going to actually go do that right now. <laughs> Excellent. That sounds great. Um, thank you. Good, good, good. Got a good crew. Um, Chris, is this your first new books call? I'm forgetting. We have talked about it many times, but this, I think, is the first time I have shown up in person on a Monday. Excellent. And Jose, I'm not sure. Have you been on a... Okay, cool. Um, good. So let me just do a little level setting and then we can do a little check-in and then dive in. Uh, the level set is that we are busy trying to write some, write and publish some neo books where the book is a shiny cultural artifact that people know. Uh, but the book is really bait to get people to connect to the nuggets that make up the book, which are live documents interwoven on the web with metadata, with a whole bunch of other things, including with communities of people who are either editing and improving the document or talking about the subjects of the document, or the metadata might include pointers to the best places we know of to have a good conversation about the topic of that particular nugget. Uh, and this idea of nuggets is that uh, a neobook is composed of a bunch of nuggets that are, might, be, might, might be an image, but mostly would be text, that then roll up into chapters, the chapters roll up into uh, the bulk of the book, then you add some front matter, end matter, a, a nice cover to it, and then you use some kind of uh, either a documentation generator or some, or some other sort of software to squeeze that out into EPUB and Kindle file format so that you can publish it as a book book. Um, there's a funny video from back when where uh, IKEA sent out their catalog one year. I'll post it here. I, I, I think I shared the link on the last Neobooks call because I remembered it, but they, they talk about, we'd like to introduce the book book and they show their catalog and they talk about how fast the interface is and how how uh how rich the resolution of their of their screen is and all that kind of stuff and they're just it's just the ikea catalog that they're showing off for the year um experience the power of a book book it's right here and i will add it to our chat um and we have um, four, maybe five or more neobooks in progress. Uh, Klaus is writing a neobook uh, or several neobooks about uh, regenerative agriculture and trying to figure out how to explain the concepts to people who might be at different levels of development. So he's using Spiral Dynamics as a framework for sort of the latter half of his work. Uh, Rick has uh, a manuscript that he's interested in neobooking and, and going in that way. Um, I'm writing a neo book about uh, design from trust, which is an idea I had back, I don't know, 2010-ish. Uh, and part of the idea of neo books is that the nuggets are repurposable, composable, reusable, uh, so that we might violate one of the unwritten rules of book writing, which is that all the content of a book should really be original and unique uh, in that. Uh, Jose might decide to write a book that's parallel to or crisscrosses through Design from Trust, 
And he might reuse a chapter of mine, but then have a very different thesis and direction. And if I can write in a composable way, if I can write in a way <clears throat> that is repurposable, and there's all sorts of other questions about tone and narrative, and I don't think this would work for fiction, although there has been a whole bunch of experimental fiction where you hopscotch around a plot and, and so forth. So maybe it would, I don't know, but that could be really actually an interesting experiment as well. Uh, but that uh, over time, neo books. Uh, individual neobooks might improve so that the third edition of a neobook might benefit from the fact that the community has nibbled on all the different nuggets and improved them over time. And then you post a new version that's substantially improved over the very first version that came out, but also that different individuals or the same individual could reuse uh, nuggets in different manuscripts. And then the nuggets might also manifest in presentations as slides in a deck, except they would need to look a little different. So the same exact content might be manifest as three bullet points, let's say, uh, or a short quote uh, that is a call out that really is the same set of ideas. How does the nugget uh, get connected to or contain all of its different meta, in, uh, meta incarnations? Uh, given that we have chat GPT and other LLMs now, we could ask uh, the LLM to rewrite the book in a, at a second grade level uh, or as a picture book, perhaps. And that would be another version of the same thing because the nuggets, the ideas in them would still be the same. So that's generally uh, the process. Uh, Pete and I are kind of, I'm, I'm nominally the publisher here, although that involves a series of responsibilities I don't have the bandwidth for and we haven't quite figured out all the moving parts. Uh, Pete uh, is nominally the engine room of coding and uh, platform and all that um, uh, through his generosity of being here in our calls and, and helping out. Um, there's a big piece of the NeoBooks vision that I think overlaps nicely and extends nicely. Uh, Pete's massive wiki vision. Uh, and Pete, if you wanted to riff on that for a moment, that would be uh, possibly useful because people could then see. And I'm using Pete's infrastructure to write my particular NeoBook I think most other uh, neobook writers are, are using Google Docs uh, in, for the most part, but I'm writing in uh, Obsidian, writing markdown files that are pushed to GitHub. So they are publicly available and GitHub offers the platform where these documents are already available to whoever might bump into them through GitHub's fork and pull uh, and other collaboration protocols. So that's entirely a possibility. Why don't I pause and Pete, if you want to add anything to that, and I will add that April and I were in San Diego for a workshop this weekend and got to go for a hike with Pete and his lovely wife. And it was just wonderful to be out in the sunshine and to be able to see one another face to face. It was super fun. Um, thanks, Jerry. Um, I think everybody here pretty much knows the, gets the, the idea of Massive Wiki. So I'll, I'll skip that part and answer questions later if need be. Cool. Then let me stop and ask, answer questions for whatever anybody wants to know about state of the state of the project. Uh, Jose, you're muted. We can't actually hear you. Um, I was just wondering, there isn't one published yet. I no, think. we do not have a we do not have one out. We do not. <clears throat> Pete and I do not yet have the capacity to squeeze one out into e, a Kindle, e, uh, into EPUB format, for example. Uh, that would be a, a a milestone. We'd like to get there. Yeah. Are you? I was going to say, are you close to having content? to do that and you just need the manufactory piece so Klaus's first uh, book in that sense is pr is pretty close to that and uh, we could take what he's got and get that far no problem i mean we we could take what he's written and go that direction yes and then i presume you want to automate a bunch of that process rather than cuz i you know i can easily take the text and make an ebook version or pump it into something and print out a physical copy. In fact, I think, I, I think I'm even sitting on a massive treasure trove of ISBN numbers if you really wanted to do that. Ooh, because, I like that. You know, everybody should have a couple thousand of those laying around. I thought I, I had I thought I had a bad uh, parked URL habit, but uh, yeah, that's that's sort of the <laughs> old old school parked URLs, isn't it? Isn't it? Kind of more, more or less, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that that sounds great. We'd love to we'd love to sort of get get that far. Pete and I went and exported some of Klaus's manuscript uh, out of Google Docs to see if we could nuggetize, and we bumped into a bunch of things that Google that that um, Google does on export, like wrapping URLs funny, and it's got a bunch of codes. 
that we were a little stumped by. So we, we kind of got that far, but uh, not not as far as we probably need to to get this thing done. You got the code for unwrapping the URL. So it's, excellent. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, the other the other mysterious bits of of meta data that that like floated out, we can probably identify and call as well. But um, but then th there's a bunch of other things that show up once you start thinking this way. One of which is, oh, well, how do I write Wikily? What does it mean to nuggetize? Uh, where do we put the metadata? How does the metadata accompany uh, the material in some way that's uh, comfortable and intuitive, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. And we've explored these things only lightly, uh, a lot of them. We haven't gotten that deep into them. And I'm pretty sure, and, and Chris, your broad exposure across like hypertextuality and all of that might actually be super helpful here too. Um, I'm pretty sure other people have, have explored these things and solved some of the problems and we just aren't necessarily aware of them yet. So um, piecing all that together is a, a piece of our mission here. Um, uh, let me go back one second. Uh, Pete, I'm going to take some liberties with uh, Massive for a second to talk a little bit about the connection between Massive and Neobooks. Um, I've been using the the metaphor of mycelium a bunch to talk about OGM-y things and uh, kind of how to build a shared memory, uh, in part because if I talk about building a shared encyclopedia, all I've got to do is point to Wikipedia and say it runs on a wiki, it, its servers live here, here's the software, you can even use it, you can use all the content. Every part of Wikipedia is kind of obvious and apparent and visible and reusable. A shared memory where we're doing something at some other level uh, with, with other kinds of documents uh, is sort of more abstract than that. And neobooks aren't quite at that level of abstraction, like, like the brain that I use or Kumu or other tools, but there's somewhere in between where, where uh, we're kind of above it. And um, so I've been using mycelium because it's connective tissue that has uh, that metabolizes uh, materials, that has nutrients in it, a bunch of other stuff. And then mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of mycelial growth. Uh, and a neobook, metaphorically, is a mushroom out of the mycelium of the nuggets that are woven, interacting, linked, have metadata, all these other sort of richnesses that only somebody who's down in there working on a particular nugget would necessarily see or care about. Uh, and another fruiting body, another mushroom might be a presentation on the same exact topic. So if, if someone wrote a book and then gave a presentation on the same book, that would be another mushroom popped up out of kind of the same body of, of nutrients and, and uh, mycelial uh, webs uh, to do that. And Pete is in some sense building the, uh, the platform that allows the mycelia to work and to be shared and to let people participate in all that. And he's I, not... I'm going to use the phrase less interested, but it's not within scope of Massive Wiki necessarily to do the things that produce mushrooms that turn into applications that live on top of it. Um, and but, that's, but it's a very complementary vision, and it's absolutely something that extends and improves and lives on uh, on Massive Wiki. And so there's there's kind of this uh, symbiotic uh, partnering or interaction of ideas and and visions and wishes. That's that's going on here that that I really like. And Pete, stop me if I or correct me if I've misrepresented some of that. It's it's fair. Um, a uh, to 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 make something a little bit more explicit. Massive work, Wiki is not the only project I work on. Um, in discussion with uh, Dre and Jordan Sukut, um, we were talking about what Massive Wiki is supposed to be doing, and it's it is actually fairly tight. Um, but then uh, I, I have a lot of other projects that interlock with Massive Wiki. So, um, so when Jerry said Massive Wiki isn't interested in blah, that doesn't mean that Pete isn't interested in blah. He probably is. Yep. And, and then the other projects could be, at least from my perspective, metaphorically be seen as like other mushrooms that are fruiting from Massive Wiki in some sense, because there are other applications or other ways of, of doing this kind of stuff. We should also point out that Jordan has used Massive Wiki probably more than any human and has like, I don't know how many words of prose on a series of kind of books that aren't aren't yet neo books, but could be, et cetera. And he and Pete and I have had a couple of discussions in the last couple of weeks that are exciting because all these things are sort of flowing together very nicely. Um, he's, he calls them, well, he calls what he's working on Wikibooks. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the 
the vision is similar, but not as as well de well developed as NeoBooks. Um, is the the whole wiki, whole Lionsburg wiki, is up to about one point three million words, I think, and so probably at least over a million of that is is wiki books. It's wiki.lionsburg.org, I think. Can you put a link in uh, there? Lionsburg.wiki. Oh, Lionsburg.wiki. That's right. It's even better. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Uh, so questions, thoughts, comments. I, I do have one question about the metaphor of nuggets. Um, because for me, the nugget um, implies does it doesn't apply what I'm trying to do. Uh huh. Is is it's it's sort of like I mean the, the, how I'm understanding a nugget of wisdom or something that is transmitted. Whereas I actually I'm more interested in how to ask questions that enable people to create nuggets on an ongoing basis, so to speak. That it's an iterative process. So for me, it 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 it's just. I, I don't know what a better metaphor is, but I just wanted to give a reaction to that. Um, thanks, Rick. And nuggets, the, the nuggets language showed up for me because these are valuable, shiny objects like a gold nugget. That's kind of where I was going. But I think the intention of, and and the neo books thing starts with the word book, partly because books are well-known cultural objects, but they're yeah. just bait. They're not the real story under the hood. The real story under the hood is a lot more what you just said, which is how do we provoke discussion at fractal discussion at all different levels? How do we get people to share more of what they think, even if we disagree with it? How do we negotiate those disagreements and do more interesting things? So I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I didn't describe, and I think you're rightly pointing to it, that is amenable to uh, your vision in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's just that uh, it's more, I mean, to me, sometimes um, nuggets imply content, uh, whereas actually I'm, I'm talking about process rather than content. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'll just have to think about it, uh, uh, if I can come up with a different metaphor to capture what I'm trying to um, describe. Because to me, it's uh, it, it's not a shining object. It's um, it's more a method of inquiry. I totally yeah. agree. And, yeah. and, and, I, and I think you're pointing out that I'm, I'm in some sense trapping myself by metaphors that I think will appeal to muggles, to people who are not deep into this, and attract them to the process and the conversation that you and I both care about a lot. Well, uh, you muted yourself accidentally again. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I would call that the very, um, um, the manipulative use of marketing to use metaphors to attract people, even if, I don't know. Who, me? If they, well, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, psychological manipulation, there's ethical psychological manipulation, and of course it's unethical. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I do credit you for being on the ethical side of this. Boy, is the line between the two fuzzy. Um, Klaus, please. Sure, there's a line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what, uh, what occurred to me just uh, fairly recently is that writing these, these neo books is actually also a training program for your GBT. Um, because inadvertently, when you're pursuing your hypothesis on a number of topics, um, you have to feed data into the GPT so it can respond to it. And I just got a message from uh, uh, OpenAI, I don't know, but a month ago, six weeks ago or so, that uh, my, uh, my account is now maintaining every conversation I've ever had and builds on it. Um, so, so that's pretty significant. Um, because I mean I'm on my second neo book here, and so the the uh, so so you're not just building a neo book; you're really building an understanding in the AI you're working with, you know, to to dive much much deeper uh, into a specific topic. Um, so I think that is that is uh, a significant uh, uh, insight to to. Uh, to consider you know, what you're doing with this AI. Um, and then I have, um, so, so in that sense, you know, my new book volume two is an exploration. Uh, it's, uh, and, and I, uh, 
it's it's based on theory you um you know uh, stepping into the future as it emerges um that means i'm i'm constantly um feeling you know it's really sensing feeling where the the uh commons conversation is moving and going uh me thinking where it should be going and uh, and then accordingly insert my next chapter now, so i've been twirling for quite some time now on um the need to to inform and educate the public on the linkages between the decisions we make about food and menus and their impact you know, to not just their own personal health but also on the environment and you know, the world around them and i've been and and i can't move on uh, uh, it's uh um there's so much disturbance uh and turmoil in that conversation frame you know in that uh in that uh um in the commons you know that where, where these things are debated and you can see the intentional injection of misleading pieces of information that you have to then counter yeah you know? so so but all the while um uh you're you're looking at at uh the ai as a supporting tool so right now i'm i'm starting to develop for example uh, one of the hottest topics in the industry right now is a uh, uh a method to measure low carbon intensity scores so so the what that means is that by applying regenerative practices um you become you you can move from an intensity score of let's say 30 for corn whatever that number means right but 30 you can actually turn this negative meaning that your soil is now sequestering carbon instead of pushing it out um and I inserted the idea of if you can measure carbon intensity, you should also be able to measure the nutrient quality of the crop coming out of that soil simply by using a spectrometer. And so that's now going spinning. So I'm developing a GPT that that uh, that measures or that, that provides a statistical frame on how to to define nutrient quality of crops. And that GPT, of course, is based on what I've been working on for the last year, you know, the entire knowledge base about regenerative agriculture. I'm also, I just started working on another one, um, a, a, a nutrition for health and disease prevention focused on cancer patients so that you can assist uh, a, a cancer patient with a nutritional program that deprives the cancer cell of nutrients while feeding the recovery from chemo for your healthy cells, which is I developed as with my daughter. My daughter had stage four lymphomic cancer when she was 26 years old. And I moved in with her and, and, and did all this research part of what, what does chemo do and how does this all work. We had her clean in 10 weeks. You know, she's now 37 years old and on her fourth baby. So, and, and she is literally was in her bone marrow. So, and and the the healthcare industry is just now becoming aware you know, of the power of, of nutritional interventions in supporting healthcare. So, so these are, so, so I'm just, I'm just uh, you know, putting out a bunch of stuff here. But so the, the, the point in, I mean, my, my primary objective now really is to train the AI to understand this stuff and to 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 um to just know you know when 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 uh, these kinds of queries come and people are asking these kinds of questions to just know uh, what uh, the, what a, a good response and a personalized response would be thank you Klaus. um Pete and Rick and actually, um, at somewhere on the road, uh, Jesse, if you wanted to riff on what you said in the chat earlier, uh, that would be great too. Um, 
I have a kind of a separate topic thing. I'm going to hit return in the chat. Um, uh, our our KDB print on demand book is just out. Um, so there's some interesting publishing stuff that you know that that was both the process of working collectively and then you know seeing it in print. Um, I, I wanted to come back to Rick's uh, Rick's uh, small reaction to um, nuggets as, as a word, and and I I appreciate Rick the the observation, and uh, I I like the looking for a new word. Um, so uh, uh, it's also kind of a you know a a, a thing versus a, a process, or you know an output versus a process. Also, a noun versus a verb. Um, and then I, I, I wanted one thing I didn't quite hear uh, in Jerry's descriptions. I think he he talked around it, but I wanted to to say it very loud and clear. The a, a thing about neobooks is the components of them um, are meant to be composable um, and recomposable with other neobooks. So a big part of what Jerry uh, means when he says nugget. Um, Along with you know all the other things we just talked about is uh, the neobic decomposes into component parts and then can be recomposed in different uh, different formations, um, different processes, uh, and can also hopefully recompose with other uh, neobooks too. So that's the that's I think that's the like the core of it kind of. Thank you so much. That's great. That's a great added explanation. Really appreciate it. Uh, Rick. You know, I mentioned this before, actually, and I, I'm very curious about, um, you know, I don't know whether, Klaus, you've been formally interviewed about the process you went through in doing your neo books, because I think we can learn from your experience. And, um, you know, it, you know, it could be an interview that we do here that you sort of unpacked you know, it, so that it becomes a sort of roadmap for other people who might want to sort of go on a similar journey. Actually, the, the word that came to mind, uh, the metaphor that came to mind uh, it, as a complement to the nugget are seeds. Uh, so the seeds of ideas or seeds of inquiry or seeds of this. To me, that it implies something that's, you know, more organic, whereas a nugget to me is something that's static. Um, so anyway, I just put that uh, metaphor into the hopper for consideration. Thank you. Um, super useful. Uh, and you've caused me to start reflecting on, uh, like, one of the reasons I like mycelium as a metaphor is that it's a growing, it's, exactly. a, it's, a, it's an organism right. that's busy growing and metabolizing and helping things that are around it and all that yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, well, maybe we should use spores, <laughs> except... Yeah. <laughs> seeds are something that I think people are more familiar with than spores, but uh, and then well, you could call them spores, seeds, and nuggets. You know, <laughs> that's true. And pretty soon we're talking about the last, the, the last of us, right? The series. Um, I, didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't sense an overwhelming uh, uh, response from Klaus as to whether he'd be willing to share his his labor of love as a as a way of um, you know shining an example on on how you know, we could learn from your experience. But maybe the reason why I have been able to tease out some uh, uh, pretty good information from this AI is because I'm probably the least trained in the group on programming and, uh, you know, formal interaction with computer systems. So I just basically took the position of... Uh, uh talking with the ai like it's my buddy right so we are conversation partners so i, I actually instructed it to be to uh, interact with me as a conservation partner uh, and so and then there are you know some other things that i that i loaded in um to to frame the conversation i mean you basically put a ring around you know, the conversation uh structure that you want to build so it's not complicated at all it's just uh Surprisingly simple, maybe. Jesse, please. Thanks. I, I had... What's that? Rick was speaking. I'm oh. sorry. No, no, sorry. So I would just simply say I wouldn't underestimate oh, what you've done, even as a as a novice. Um, you know, I, I I just 
I, I certainly would appreciate learning from your experience. Maybe I'm the only one, but you know, each time somebody does it, then it it creates a learning community about how to do this. I mean, you're you're ahead of the curve, so even if you think you're a novice, it's still one step ahead of me. Um, I will I will sort of say that Paulus's experience is extremely centered on ChatGPT and how to use that to generate a text. And we have not really neo-booked the text. Klaus's experience is not typical of a neo-book quite yet. So he could he could teach a lot about how to collaborate with a, a GPT and create a GPT and all that, but less so on the neo-books front. Well, I see it as both and rather than either or, but anyway, that's fine. Cool. Uh, Jesse, then Pete. Well, um, I appreciate, uh, Klaus, you, you helping me support the beginning stages. So really... In the bottom of my heart, it helped me get to the next stage, but we're still working on the same goal. And um, working in isolation seems like a disservice to the world. <laughs> so looking forward to connecting again. Part of it is that when there are two people or two groups of people working on the same goal in two different ways, um, what ends up showing up is, well, what is for the commons and what is for my own good so that I'm going to keep it to myself so that I can make money? Um, and I, I want to like you said, Pete, work collectively. I want to open up my my AI chat GPT whenever I come up with one day as I teach it. Um, or I want to like look at how we can apply the uh, phenomenal works that you are working on for trust and agriculture or the things that I'm interested in and seeing how the Venn diagrams start building itself uh, somehow. I don't know what that space looks like, but that's the playground I want to be in. Um, so... So basically, it would meet Nick's, Rick's needs at the same time as really support our initiatives together. Agreed. Totally. Thank you. Uh, Pete? Um, I, I, I wanted to address Rick's observation that that he didn't get uh, a enthusiastic, oh, wow, I'll share everything I know um, uh, from Klaus. And uh, Klaus, I apologize uh, if I'm misspeaking, um, but uh, but I, I I think let me let me uh, let me share something I've observed with Klaus, uh, you know, over the past uh, three or four months working with him, kind of side by side. Um, Klaus is hyper focused on on essentially the content of you know soil health and and regenerative agriculture and bioregions, because he's extremely aware. <laughs> And extremely um, motivated to try to save us, you know, uh, save the world for everybody and for his kids and his grandkids and his great grandkids. So anything that's off off that mission, like, why don't you tell people how you do that? It kind of goes like, you know, in one ear and out the other. He's like on mission, right? He's very focused on his mission, and I, I and I appreciate that very much. So thanks, Bob. Uh, and if I'm wrong, please uh, please let me know. So. So Rick, you're totally right. Uh, the experience that Klaus has had in in you know composing his his pieces, I think, is a valuable thing. Um, and speaking as a bit of a journalist, um, the reason I set up uh, the Bioweekly Plex Dispatch is to have a venue or a mechanism, a mechanism of journalism where you kind of try to extract some of the wisdom out of people who are working too hard to think. To, to even talk about what they're doing, right? So um, I, I think to answer your question, Rick, it's a good one. Um, the, the right thing to ask Klaus is something more like, hey, can we set up an interview where I'll have uh, two or three interviews with you for half an hour each over the course of a couple of weeks and I'll write down your process, what you're doing. Is that okay? And I think Klaus would be happy to do that. Um, but it's not going to be something that he like, you know, splits his brain and, and works on by himself. Is that agreeable, Klaus? I mean, are you, is that? Yeah, also don't underestimate the technical skills that are required to to ask the right questions. Uh, the, the, I mean, I've, I mean, I, I grew up in a in a family of chefs. I'm the fourth generation chef, you know, in Germany. My dad had a restaurant. Everybody had restaurants. I spent a lifetime uh, in the food business. I worked international in in senior level uh, corporate positions. 
Um, I worked internationally, uh, 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 30 countries, where I had teams in 30 countries of analysts. So there is a knowledge base that you, you know, it's not that you can't just share, you know, it's, it's not that easy to replicate. Um, and I've always been you know, keenly, I've, I've always been in systems design, you know, because I worked for Disney and designed food systems for theme parks in, I mean, Hong Kong, Disneyland, California Adventure and stuff like this. And so you, so I have a knack, obviously, for thinking in in systems without being trained to do that. It's just uh, instinctive. You know? And so, um, it's not. It's, so it's not that easy to share. But what I may be able to help is to help you get your technical skills on the ground you know, and and uh, frame them. And how do you go about you know deepening this? You know? Because I may ask a question where. You know, I expect a certain range of answer. Then I find that I only was at like twenty percent, and then the GPT fit, fits in another eighty percent that I hadn't thought of, where right, that are linked. But you have to start the right question, and so, um, yeah, the Socratic method of questioning. You know, so it's maybe the easiest way to explain that. But you have to have some technical skills to get into technical conversations. Um, love that. Other thoughts, questions about what we've just been talking about? Yeah, in some respects, it's sort of meta-learning in the sense that it's sort of like uh, the story of how you did your, and I understand you focus, that's not where you, work, where you want to spend your time. And I, I completely respect that. Uh, the question is, um, you know, it could also almost be a mini book of that, that story. Uh, but the question is, uh, uh, Pete, I don't know whether you have the time or not, but I, I'm just throwing out ideas here. That's all. Hey, I mean, I'm, whatever, I'm whatever. interested in in meta learning and also uh, inter community kinds of things. So mm -hmm. I I actually would allocate some time to spend on a meta meta learning uh, neo book. Mm -hmm. And then I think one of the most significant uh, insights I've been in conversations about you is theory you and use spiral dynamics in combination for you know, five or six years. Once I came across that, instinctively, I'm thinking, yeah, I mean, that just makes the most sense because you may have theory, you the, the progression of uh, insights and so on, but you're talking with different people. And theory, you is actually doing a form of spiral dynamics in the way that they do their mm -hmm. um, meditative exercises, you know, to bring people to the same platform and so on and so on. So going going right into spiral dynamics is just a more direct way and more also a more shareable way of doing this. But I mean, you learn that uh that different groups of cognition actually speak different languages now they're using different metaphors yeah right yeah you know, they're using different idioms and so so you have to to really think your way in to this kind this frame of mind uh and ai by now since since i you know laid, laid in the entire uh background of uh, spiral dynamics is is my, my ai now is, is right going right there who are you talking with you know and so we need to reframe this uh you know in into this this kind of don't talk about climate change with a farmer right farmers believe into god and god's uh it's god's uh, domain to uh, uh to impact the global climate so talk to a farmer about soil and water you know? But there's, I mean, and then then I have done my 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 you know, research and conversations have confirmed this, right? I mean, there was an article in the Washington Post the other day saying, yeah, the, the, this farmer, I mean, these farmers just just don't talk about climate change. They just don't go there. You know, this is the domain of a higher power. So it's this kind of uh, of insight, that, and I shared this with. Uh, I'm working with a professor from Michigan State University. Who is developing communications, you know, with for the climate reality project and the Sierra Club and so on. And she totally embraced this kind of mm -hmm. uh form of communication. Yeah. So it's it's yeah, it's a bunch of stuff. Um so Klaus, a question for you to ponder. Um I'm I'm comfortable with the idea that different people have different metaphors and language and uh, that spiral dynamics is a way of modeling those kinds of things. 
I'm really uncomfortable. And when it's come up, it's always made me go, ah, that all farmers are blue and all churchgoers are green or whatever the right levels are. That makes me really uncomfortable. So I think there's a there's something missing in the formula, which is how do I let a person find their way to the form of expression that works for them? Assuming that there's a multitude of varieties of need, there's a need for a variety of forms of expression. But the moment you blanket everybody and say, like, you can't talk to a farmer this way because they all believe this. I'm like, ah, they're really complicated. And some of them are over here. Some of them are over there. There's big farmers, little farmers, like, like there's all kinds of people. And there's all kinds of churches too, right? So, so I think there's an impedance mismatch or something like that in the way you're coming about this, that if solved, if that, if that piece is solved, then people can find their way to the form of expression of your argument that absolutely works for them. And then they can work through the logic of it and join the movement and be happy ever after. Does that make sense? So our research shows that roughly 60% or so of farmers uh, are very much in this climate change is nonsense kind of, uh, uh, bucket. But does that make um, them red or blue or whatever? It's blue. I mean, it's primarily blue. I don't blue. think that's a blue argument. It is, absolutely. When you go back into my new book, number one, yeah. right, there is, uh, I asked the... Uh, I asked the uh, chat GPT to uh, give me a definition of what uh, different colors are thinking about uh, climate change in within the context and so on and so on. When you read through this and you look at blue, it's right there. So so, so people who believe in higher power, you know, who believe in God is in charge, uh, that's what you get. That's that's. I mean, I've I've confirmed I'm a, this I'm a multiple tiny bit, times. I'm a tiny bit more concerned now because you're taking ChatGPT's response to you as if it were like a, a study that's true. And the fact that you've asked ChatGPT for a couple paragraphs on each of these things, and that that doesn't show up as a prominent signal in the other colors, you're assuming that means that this this isn't relevant to them. I'm a little confused now because I don't think this is as black and white as ChatGPT is giving it to you. Okay, so um, this and actually... you're also using ChatGPT as a as a like determinative authority on this, which all of us are like, wait, what? I mean, I won't speak for all of us, but I'm I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, so that's a good conversation because that's really important stuff. Um, hold on, let me just pull that up. Um, the uh, let me just take the screen for a second. Cool. As you're doing this class, I'll just say I've been reading uh, Ed Catmull's book, Creativity, about Pixar and the story of Pixar and all that. And there's a bunch of really lovely things in there about how, you know, about how he used to deal with uh, creative creative conflict and all that kind of stuff, which are great. I recommend the book. So I asked ChatGPT, and this is after, you know, uh after uh, introduce introductory uh, conversations, you know, food, the spiral visit basically is what uh, what uh, um, uh, the uh, the original authors here uh, framed this at. So I asked, write an eight hundred word essay about what the world looks like to an individual living in their respective VMEM zone, considering the information this group has access to and knows to process. What are they thinking? Who are their thought leaders operating at a higher level of consciousness? And what are the motivations of these thought leaders for engaging with a specific V-meme? What is the most recent state of cognitive dissonance caused by the divergence of talking about climate change versus observing it in real life? So that was my, my question, right? So beige is quite obvious. I mean, uh, you have people who, who are far more worried about where they sleep tonight and what they get to eat. And so you move up into into uh into red you know which is sort of the marker range of the world um and that and farmers are uh you know somewhere in that zone but here are conversations in blue in blue so the world is a structured place governed by universal laws moral codes and societal norms you know um the sources of information are often trusted institutions that align with their world flew few thought leaders engaging with this group. Uh, so anyway, so so here, um, when it comes to the issue of climate change, cognitive dissonance for those in the in the blue VMAM can be significant. 
On the one hand, they're receiving information from trusted sources, be it the Pope, uh, that prompts them to consider the issue. On the other hand, the effects of climate change might directly contradict their longstanding beliefs in a just world governed by a higher power or reliable institutions. So, so I'm just, yeah, and I've shared this with, uh, with Michigan State University and with a New York University professor. And they're super excited about this because they're re actually reframing the way they're communicating uh, with specific groups. Um, and so, so I, we, we, I'm, I mean, I'm uh, assisting the launch of a questionnaire by um, by uh, uh, the Climate Reality Project, and they have you know, a couple of million uh, uh, people uh, volunteers. And we are developing, or we have developed a questionnaire that goes to farmers, and we want them to talk about their experience with uh, 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 with, with the uh, with regenerative agriculture and soil. And we had a discussion where I talked with the leadership, asking them specifically to not mention climate change in this conversation, because even if it's forty percent of farmers, you know, who absolutely can't get uh, towards this. You're destroying, you know, I mean, the impact of, of because you are turning off so many of them by mentioning this. So it's actually over 60% of farmers are in the blue. Uh, some of our blue orange, some are blue red, but they're centered blue. You know, very religious people. You know, uh, um, I mean, the evangelical movement is very strong in there. So it is what it is. You know? And and uh, so that's, that's you know, where... And we find our impact and our outreach is getting so much stronger because the key message here is the way the American political system is designed is that you have personal, you have a representation in your community, right? There is a, 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 a House of Representatives, you know, you're electing them to represent you in Washington. And then, that, and then each state has two senators. So what's this person talking about in washington how are they voting you know is this in your interest and and so you have to pay attention so to have volunteers like the sierra club and the climate reality party go and talk to the to the congress person and i've done that i've been in washington uh, several times and it's it's ridiculous they don't pay any attention unless you show up with a check you know and it has to be a six figure check before it's even getting noticed so so we are we are switching course now, and we are talking to the farmers and have them talk to the member of Congress because these guys are the ones voting for them. You know, so that's the idea and behind it. And we're in the middle of executing on this and very fast so because um the 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 farm bill is on the docket. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and it's super contentious. It got pushed into 2024 from last year when it was supposed to get decided, but it's it's hot now, right? It's hot in March. Yeah, it, it's coming up March, April, and so, and so, uh, um, yeah. So we need to engage the base, and you can't engage the base if you're offending them with you know your opinions and and the way you talk about it. So you have to be really context specific, and in this sense also color specific. You know the way we call it. So anyway, so there is nothing unusual about this. And then, if as regard to like moral considerations. Cambridge Analytica did exactly this, right? But during during the during the uh, last election, that's exactly what they did, right? So then we want to have uh, hurdles where we, we just can't do this. It's not uh, the right thing to do. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody else does it, so, so I'm, uh, I'm not I'm not trying to say it's not the right thing to do. I'm I'm trying to express that um, that. You're trying to not turn people off, and what, by not saying climate change, I can totally get that a bunch of people might stay in the room and have their conversation. It makes complete sense to me. But if they figure out, and people are pretty astute about this, that you're generalizing about them in a way that they disagree with, that would probably turn them off. And I'm trying to figure out how to dissolve that problem, that possible issue. And it might overcomplicate things for you. I don't know. I'm interested in what other people in the call also think about this. And Stacey, if you want to step in also, I'm curious about how you how you think about this too. But uh, Rick, if you'll go ahead. No, Stacey can go if you, she feels like it or Jesse. I, I, do, I, I can wait. If they don't, that's fine. I can, I can. Go for it. Stacey is nodding. You okay. go. 
Right. Um, you know, class, what, what I'm hearing now is your storytelling. And to me, this is the interesting part. And that's exactly what uh, Pete was talking about. And what I what I was hearing from Jerry was his discernment about something that may be an overgeneralization. Having said that, I, I actually went to the uh, I've been watching some of the Knight Foundation videos from the recent conference. And the first one, actually, and I'm, I'm blanking on a name. I, I, it's in my blog post. I put it in there. A woman who who talked about who wrote the book, the first book on biases in algorithms. And it was a fast, fascinating talk. But, you know, on the one hand, I think you need the discernment to, de to deconstruct those types of biases that are unhelpful, so to speak. On the other hand, what if we were to actually design the algorithms that were pro, you know, health, pro farming, whatever, if it was designed in that way? I think the point that I'm hearing from Jerry is that, you know, there, there's there's a risk of getting too swept in by a particular biases that may be an overgeneralization. That's all. Thank you, Charles. Uh, but it's a discernment. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, you know, I, I regard chat GPE as something you discern, you have to discern what it's saying and you have to sort of, you know, you, 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 you have to be careful what you're getting out. And I'm sure you, you've done your due diligence on that as well. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Stacey, I don't want to force you in, but uh, you have so many interesting perspectives of talking to normal humans and how they accept normal the humans. <laughs> yeah, how they how they accept uh, conversations, right? And yeah, well, I I really agree with your point. You know, where you got kind of poked, I was getting poked, and I also agree with ex everything that Klaus said as a way to approach the conversation. But I think all conversations should probably start in the beige. And I hope I'm using that, you know, I don't know spiral dynamics. So I'm just assuming that beige is that. Okay, good. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I everything's been said that I would say. I So I had put in the chat, I think it's enough to say when we're dealing with farmers, this is the way we do it without saying why or because they're not all the same. And there's no reason to even explain why this is just the best way to do it for this situation. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Uh, anyone else with thoughts on this? Cool. Um, Rick, you had put a, a some work in front of us that you'd love us to pay attention to. We might it's, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 in no hurry to do it. Actually, I'd be curious to, just to get a sense from uh, if, if Chris and Jose are interest uh, willing to sort of get a sense of what the reactions are to what we've just been talking about. You know, it's always difficult when you know a group have been move, you know been talking for a while for people coming in, but sometimes out, outside perspectives can be uh, you know can can be helpful. So I don't know whether you feel like sharing any thoughts about what you've been listening to. Perfect, Rick. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Jose, Jesse, Chris, if you want to jump in, please do. Yeah, this yeah. is no pressure. This is just in the spirit uh -huh. of equity, you know? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that, Rick. Um, so the, the first thing that comes to mind is I was kind of expecting more of a conversation about a technical process of, of how do we, what are we building? How do we build it? And, and how do we uh, make it do that? And, or a conversation around why, um, some fundamentals around why we're doing this. Um, and I think there's been a little bit of, kind of touching on it, but not really sort of a holistic view of it, at least that I perceived. Um, and so, so that that was also a, a question for me. Um, as to the specifics of any one neo book or, or you know, the, the subject matter, if you will, of any one neo book, I think there's, um, my question is, is, is there, some kind of ontology by which we're going to be looking at these things, or are they? Are we just sort of saying, "Here's here's one idea, here's another idea, and I'm working on this kind of thing, and you're working on that kind of thing"? How do how do we then 
understand them in the scope of what a neo book is, if if such a thing exists. Do we do we back to the seeds, nuggets, uh, whatever? Um, have we talked about what those are that leads us to whatever projects are here and um, and that they kind of, there's some fundamental ones. Uh, are there, is there some first principle or something that we're starting with um, that we can then say, okay, well, how do we take this to the next thing, to the next thing? And does this apply to that, to those threads of uh that arise from from that seed so so yeah for for our first conversation it seems like uh, i'm struggling to grasp at at some of this um to be frank thanks Jose. i'll take a swing at answering you by using what might be a a, a strange metaphor um i so far the neobooks project is more like a farmhouse ale than carlsberg lager um by you which just I, lost me even further. Thank you so and, much. And, and no, no, no. I, I need to explain it, and I know I need to explain <laughs> it. Um, so Carlsberg is famous way back when for purifying yeasts, and basically then open sourcing the new yeast they discovered, which reduced the incidence of beer disease. Because when people brewed beer all across Europe, which was like how, what you drank all the time, some batches of beer would kill you because you had the wrong bacteria in there. So they purified it, and 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 basically health went up after they did that. Farmhouse ales, you basically put the brew near a window and whatever whatever stuff comes in forms the basis of that batch of beer, uh, whatever bacteria are in the air. And in some sense, we're more like that here in that we're seeing who shows up, who's interested in writing something. If the if the neobooks happen to touch or intertwine, great. Uh, if somebody, if a, if a writer of a neobook wants to do different spurs and versions of the neobook, even, you know, that's great too. But we don't have any or ontology or thought about where should we write a neobook and what topic or anything. We, we that hasn't even really been part of the conversation. Uh, so I, I mean that just to explain that uh, the neobooks we have going are just people's passions and interests, and they're like this neobook thing sounds curious. Let's try that. Does that make sense? And does anybody disagree with that strange analogy? Okay, I, good. I, I don't disagree, but I have a different way of telling the story. Perfect, because I wouldn't expect anybody to come up with a farmhouse ale versus Carl Third Lager story. <laughs> um, let's say you, you see us in the midst of inventing the Neobook protocols um, and the Neobook technology and things like that. Uh, so I, I think this experiment has been going on for about a year. Uh, and during parts of the experiment, it's all about tech and parts of the experiment, it's all about content. Um, uh, after thrashing back and forth like that for a couple months in the early beginning, it was like, well, I'll tell you what, let's just write a freaking new book and then see what to do with it after we write it. Um, uh, so the, the general ideas about composability and what, what we've been calling nuggets and, and uh, having a fruitful discussion about what nugget or seeds or spores even means, mycelia even means, uh, even during this call, that's the process that we're in right now. Uh, so we are not yet in a phase of um, extreme, extreme technical production. We're still kind of mucking about looking for exactly what we think we're, we're doing and, and how to make that useful. Um, uh, I, I might sent, sense a bit of disappointment or frustration on your face. Um, <laughs> I share that. Uh, to be frank, um, folks, uh, I... I am interested more in meta learning and intercommunity stuff and, and the technologies of publishing and distributing information. That's my bailiwick. Um, and I wish we had more of that somehow. I'm not sure that I would stomp on this call to do it. Um, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm eager or itchy or something like that to get more production done. Um, and it's a it's a chicken and egg thing. We are stuck right in the middle of of chicken and egg. Um, so we can't birth a new book until we have the 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 content of it and the technical processes. We don't know what the content of a new book um, or the technical processes should be until we have, um, you know, until we're ready to publish. And so that's where we are. Pete, are there lessons we should take from the Cindy Kuhn super fast pace project right now? 
Uh, I can relate some, yeah. <laughs> um, and I apologize, I'm going to do this in a bit in a bit of a personal manner instead of a thoughtful and and um, uh, considered manner. Um, uh, uh, Cindy's a fascinating person. She ended up being kind of the Jerry to this this team. Um, we invited, uh, or she and, and Lee picked a few people and said, okay, this is a team. Um, and we kind of knew each other. We kind of didn't, we didn't have any idea what we were, were writing about, except it was supposed to be an AI. Um, uh, part of the magic of the thing coming together was Cindy continually encouraging us to, to keep going and to be happy about it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, this happened like a month and a half or so before Christmas. And so as we got to, to the, the uh, Christmas holiday, everybody's behind. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're writing about. They've written five different drafts and thrown all of them away. Um, Cindy kept saying, be positive, help each other. <laughs> Just write something, it's anything, it's going to be good and we'll publish it. Um, and she set a deadline. And um, uh, I think the deadline was after Christmas, which was kind of a curse because then it's like, we felt like we needed to take some of the, the holiday break to, to do work, uh, which I hate death marches. So it, it ended up with a bit of a death march thing. So um, there was a deadline on Friday, final, final, final deadline, bam. Um, and this was after, you know, uh, software hit deadlines and firming up deadlines. And this is the final deadline. That was on Friday. On Wednesday, here's I mean, this past, this past Friday? No, it was about two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Okay, okay. Uh, Friday deadline. Here's Pete typing up a, a, a heartfelt email. Cindy, thank you. Cindy and team, thank you so much for doing, you know, everything, blah, blah, blah. Um, I love you all. There's no way I can finish uh, in two days. Um, I give up. <laughs> I'm not going to be there. And in, in something that just amazed me, um, uh, a couple people, Wendy, Wendy Alford, our, one of our friends, uh, is one person. Two other people kind of showed up and said, Pete, it would be heartrending if you dropped out now. Um, you have to finish something. And Cindy came up with a, a, a cheat, actually. She said, he, you know, like it's more important that you turn something in that it, than it's the perfect 5,000 word. That was the target 5,000 word piece, right? I'll tell you what, just, just turn in, um, turn in 16 blank pages, you know, like put, take that email. We'll put it at the front. And then this is Pete's part of the book, right? 16 blank pages. So, um, so I, I had one-on-one -on -one calls with three other people, literally like begging and pulling and keeping me going and like pushing me up. And that, and then Friday, Cindy said, okay, I can kind of afford one more week. Um, you know, she's actually going on a trip and stuff. So she does have hard deadlines. I can kind of afford one more week. Let's just do this thing, take the weekend and, and see how far we get. And some of us will make it over line and some of us might not, and that's okay. Pete can turn in his thing and we'll put it in the middle of the book because it's an, a, a great example of the process, right? Um, so it was that over the weekend, that was somehow enough impetus for me to, me and ChatGPT to come up with 15,000 words, which is, <laughs> then I've got a, an editing problem, right? How do you get 15,000 words back down to five or 6,000? Um, the, one of the, one of the big, um, uh, so a couple of the big takeaways for me, one of them was just setting a deadline and sticking to it more or less. Um, Cindy stuck to it a little bit less than she could have, um, and that was probably a good thing. Uh, another thing was uh, somehow working it so that there was, everybody was working on their own chapter pretty much blind without anybody else, you know. I mean, we all, we all had our, our books in a Google folder, our chapters in a Google folder, and we, we were supposed to be reading each other's. I don't think most of us had enough time to, to co cross read even. Um, <clears throat> but there was a real camaraderie that, that came out of um, uh, a little bit unlike here. This is a little bit more of an open structure where people come in and come out. Um, we were all on a team and uh, <clears throat> you know we're forced to make sacrifices and push each other and hold each other up and that kind of stuff. We did actually lose one person, one person, um, you know, even after the week where I gave up um, and got back in, 
um, the very, the final final, somebody said, I'm sorry, I just can't make it. And uh, he would have been, his, his piece was actually pretty good. And um, he, you know, kind of got distracted on other things and didn't feel like finishing it. And uh, that's sad. But, so I don't know if that helps or not, but um, a, a big part of it is just deciding story. what to do <laughs> and doing it, yeah, making yeah. sure it gets done. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that with us a lot. Really appreciate that. Um, us? Yeah, um, bringing the conversation back to AI, because I think it's really important. This thing is moving so damn fast and, and uh, in so many in so many ways. Um, this new uh, upgrade that's coming out uh, uh, maybe in a month or so, I think they're targeting March. Um, this is big stuff. Um, this allows, um, and I'm actually um, working with a couple of companies now um, to, to, to help them develop a customized AI for their particular business. So what this thing does is it it allows uh, your data to be to be a proprietary. Uh, ChatGPT uh, uh, has indicated that whatever you put in to to your to this enterprise GPT will not be shared with the general database. So you have a proprietary tool that you can develop there. You can commercialize it, um, and I'm not quite sure yet how how that ends up getting shared with a customer base. Um, but I know my son, you know, he's head of uh, talent branding for Samsara, which is an AI driven company that works for logistics firms. They are developing their own proprietary AI. Um, you know, that, that controls the movement of stuff, uh, 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 logistics for airlines and buses and trucks and so on. And, and so that's the same idea, you know, that companies can develop a personalized uh, AI uh, that protects their intellectual property. This is big stuff. I mean, this is this is a major uh, de uh, development here, and it happens so fast. I mean, when you think about uh, maybe when we transition to four point from three point five to four point oh, how long ago was that, Pete? Six months ago, or you know, and. <laughs> And so then, then we get we went from 4.0 to GPTs. Now you can do your own GPT, and that has exploded. And so now here comes the next big hit, uh, where you can actually um, use your skills of developing AI, for example, to work with companies and help them set up a proprietary uh, database. So I, th I think, and so so to me, this this the whole discussion on neo books is intricately linked to AI and where AI is going because it just blows up your capacity of uh, uh, of of your work in ways that that's just unfathomable. All right, Jose, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that when you guys described uh, neo books to me, one of the things that that resonated for me and you didn't use this language i i had uh, used this language in the past uh, one of the things that i think the the open source software world has really done is um built foundations for more work and more work and more work because we we basically can build a stack of open source software and no one really has to deal with the foundational systems, right? I can build something great on top of something else and something else and something else and something else. And part of what I think is a struggle for me when we look out, everybody's writing their own book. Everybody's got their own method of seeing everything. Everybody's got their own language, their own perspective, their, you know, you name it, right? And none of us are actually building on anything. Um, and well, you you understand. I think, we're, I, I think we're describing the building, but it's very loose. But but we're trying really hard to build on on one another's stuff. Where I I think for the most part, when you write a book that's your book, and you reference a bunch of stuff, it still has your lens, right? And and it 
if I read your book, then it's your book and it has your lens and it has your voice in it. And uh, maybe I've got three nuggets from it, but I, it, it's not a collaborative effort. And I don't feel like an actually like add to what you've done. I can learn from it and abstract it and use it in some other way. And I can reference the, the lesson I learned. Here's the three lessons from this book and four lessons from that book. But I don't feel like our society as you know, this idea of books, our society has made a book an intellectual ownership copyright thing. And, and it seems to me that it, it actually has helped, but maybe it's reached the end of its ability to help where now we need to create something where we're building on each other's stack right and and the reason that i'm going down this path because i'm sure everybody kind of has, shares this this idea I, I doubt that this is a novel idea uh what what i'm missing what i hear missing for me here in this conversation today is I haven't heard us talk about this concept of, of, of a stack of, of information or knowledge or, or, or a way of framing this. And, and that actually allows us to, to work. Like, it, I, I don't think there needs to be a single OS, right? And a single graphic engine and a single, you know, right? Like, but we need those things and we need to understand what those things are. So what, what are some of the ways that we build our stack so that when somebody comes in and adds a piece to it, they can assemble the stack they want and then the, go from there or maybe tweak a stack, you know, fork a stack, make it, you know, a, a lower, you know, ch change some lower level stuff and then add their piece to it because they don't think that the current um underlying components uh suit where they're going to me that kind of thinking maybe it, my background is architecture so maybe I, I i just i need that foundation i i can't build on something that doesn't have a foundation i need to understand what that foundation is capable of doing and then build from there um so anyway that, that's just what's resonating for me Thanks, Jose, and th thank you for this feedback during our call with us. Because I, I, and it, it's, um, I'm hearing it in a very funny way because I'm completely sympathetic with everything you're saying. I think we're doing a lot of the stuff you're saying, but we're clearly, clearly not communicating it. I'm clearly not communicating it. Um, and then Pete, your explanation of the story is like, I am, I am not a good. Of uh, uh, sort of cheerleader of of people who need to write a book and and shepherd of of a bunch of people to get to some place to finish a thing on a deadline and project management is mostly foreign to me so I need to either build or find those skills or some pro some piece of this project might turn into that but I'm I'm just usually terrible at that um, with myself and with with groups so I'm I'm listening with care to this but everything you said Jose feels like a, exactly a part and we've had a whole bunch of conversations about what are the future stacks. Pete and I are busy trying to figure out what are the elements of the stack that that builds on top of Massive Wiki and all of that. That that's like. I just want to be clear world. that the yeah. stack I'm talking about is not a technical stack. Yes, uh, and and uh, exactly. And, but and, we need that as well. Uh, uh, totally agree, and I will I will share a link from my brain with you so that we can go have this conversation separately or bring it back in here because I think there's a new book in I got and I and right now I hated saying that. Uh, there's a neo book in explaining what these stacks are and how we might, how sh civilization might be shifting its stacks uh, in some way. I think that's totally a thing and and uh, ought to be a thing. And then then you said some really interesting things about books are a person's book and what about what about the collaboration? And I'm really interested in that because there's somehow this blending of voices and then this uh, this calling out of voices. That is a, a funny, delicate dance about how ideas are formed and how people want to defend ideas or represent them or whatever else. That is a part of the mix of what we're talking about here. And I, I, I don't. We haven't discussed that very much here, and I think that's also a really interesting thing for us to go back into, uh, because 
books are written by people. Uh, Pete just did an edited volume version with Cindy Kuhn and team, which is there are chapters written by different individuals, each of which is that individual's voice into the topic. That's one method. There's other methods. There's, there's also a bunch of people write one thing, and then all of them are listed at the top as authors, or it's anonymous, and none of them are listed at the top of, of, uh, as authors. All of those are just on the spectrum of, of the kinds of authorship that you're talking about. But the kind of thinking together that you're describing is like completely what I hope we're, we're about here. Anyway, you, you spun up a bunch of really useful things for me, and I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I'll pass to Pete, then Rick, then Jesse. Um, thanks, Jerry, and uh, uh, um, thank you, Jose. Like Jerry said, it's really important to kind of get this feedback, and it's great, great here. Um, uh, I wanted to tell you, or I wanted to tell, maybe I want to tell the story. I don't know. I wanted to tell you that what you described as let's write something together instead of let's write um, things that we put together and then call it together. So the book, uh, the book we just wrote, the AI book with Cindy Kuhn, um, it, we, we formed a loose team at the end of it, but um, uh, it, it was all written separately, very, very expressly, actually. I have a completely different experience 20 years ago. Um, and I, I think I even have to ask you to forget what wiki means to tell this story. So, or imagine, loosen up the, the definition of wiki and and forget that Wikipedia ever existed. Um, but it was day to day that I used to uh, write a collective knowledge base with other people where the whole thing was written as a piece by the whole collective of people. It was as if we had a collective brain and the parts of the brain were talking to each other and explaining things to each other and developing a shared knowledge together that was written output. Um, and I don't know if that sounds crazy or impossible or whatever, but we used to do it all the time. And on top of that experience, the thing that I used to love the most was seeing that collective brain having a thought um, and chasing a thought for literally months and years where the team together, if you got the whole team together and said, we've got this difficult problem of how to square the circle with um, the user interface and the technology and the human process that needs to happen for this product. Um, uh, you know, if you asked anybody at the beginning of that year or two, we would have this this difficult problem that would seem insolu insolvable. Like it's like, yeah, it can't be done. And you know, a month or two later, you'd see uh, what what was um, uh, what was kind of an internal blog post, actually. Uh, one that, so there's a, there's a number of different practices that went into constructing that collective brain thing. One of them was kind of daily notes to self, notes to the team. Um, other things were people who kind of swept together and and added things together. Part of it was just the way that you would write. Um, uh, we always wrote in the third person. So um, uh, often I would say something like I, and then I would put Pete in parentheses behind it because somebody might come along and say I, Jesse, you know, in a separate sentence. Um, uh, anyway, you'd see an internal blog post on this difficult topic come up. Here's all the things that we've been talking about. And then a month later, you'd go, huh, if I put this thing and that thing, I feel like there's some, a little bit of movement. And then somebody else would reply to that and say, no, 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 you're wrong. Here's all the different things wrong with that or whatever. And over the course of a year, you would see this, this collective brain working the problem. And, and after a while, it started to loosen up. And after a while, it was like solved. And it was like magic. And it was this, this conversation that I haven't seen happen anywhere else. I'm sure it does, but a conversation that can't really happen in an email thread or a chat system or Twitter or even books, writing books back and forth at each other. Um, it was like simpler and more easy than that and more collective and more, you know, cool. I don't know. So, um, uh, 
a, a thing that I can relate from my experiences back then. Uh, we used to have um, unconferences. The wiki people would get unconferences together. One time we had an unconference that was subbed into, I think it was the Association for Computing Machinery. Um, there was a big, you know, big ACM conference. Um, and I had this, and Ward Cunningham, the inventor of the wiki, is a big part of the ACM, actually. Um, I had this really weird experience where we did our, our collective thing, but it was within the confines of a normal kind of academic uh, scientific community. And you could look at the different people and they were just, they just were different. The wiki people would make these collective decisions about what to do for lunch. And they would collectively decide what to talk about for topics. They would collectively, you know, it was a, a temperament and, and social kind of upbringing thing or something where the, the wiki people just weren't like the, um, the, the scientists who got used to that rigid thing where I'm presenting a talk and I've had a, a peer reviewed by these people and you know it's my thing and maybe I'll share a little bit of credit with them but not too much credit and all that kind of stuff. All of that was like the, the, the populations were just dramatically different. So um, uh, I've been trying to reconstruct that social stack for a couple of years, uh, basically on top of Massive Wiki. Um, so the Massive Wiki community, we've had a couple of attempts at, at uh, wiki writing, wiki, uh, thinking wikily, that kind of stuff. Um, I also started a, another community called Prose Fusion, which is basically Massive Wiki rebranded a little bit to be more about writing. Um, and probably there's some other ones too, where trying to get that experience back. And it's really hard because I don't, I don't know exactly why it's really hard. It's really hard. It's hard to get, you know, we, we had the, the way I had that best experience um, was uh, in my wiki company where we were making the tool. So, um, so we were eating our own dog food or, or drinking our own champagne. Um, and everybody was, there, I guess there's a little bit of activation energy that it requires to be part of a team and then to be a collective part of the team adds another a bit of activation energy. And being in a company that was making a product that we were using was enough activation energy to keep pushing us back um, and contained into that space and say, well, figure out how to express yourselves in this space. There were a few other wikis that were really good too. Ward's original C2 wiki was a pretty good wiki. And then there was another one uh, called Meatball Wiki, which was uh, also working wikily together. Um, it had a really, really strong, um, uh, really strong captain, basically, I think is another, another component of it. So um, uh, Massive Wiki as a tech stack supports that really well. Um, it, it does a great job of having content that you build together, but uh, each of you can be separate, but you can be together. And if anybody wants to, either in the team or outside of the team, you can pick up the whole thing and start in another place, um, tear down some of it, rebuild some of it. Um, so Massive Wiki is a good technical substrate for it. But but you're right, it's it's actually a social process and and um, social connections and dissolving some of the ways that people are used to thinking about um, uh, how they work together, especially when all of us got brought up in an academic thing where it's like, hey, um, now that you're writing, well, whether it was longhand or typewriters or now computers, hey, now that you're writing, you know, stay away from everybody else. Don't let, you know, don't cheat, don't like share, don't do any of that. So all of us have to kind of unlearn that, uh, especially when you put your, your fingers on the keyboard or, you, you know, your, your pen on the paper. It's like right away that, that zooms you into that, that solo mindset. Um, so I'm super passionate about trying to get back that wiki style of collective thinking and collective writing. Um, so love to help however I can. Thank you, Pete. That was a lot. Um, Rick, then Jesse, and then we're near the end of our call. Yeah, I, th this will be brief, Pete, because everything you just said was music to my ears, actually. Uh, somebody who has been in academia um, and know all the, you know, and the idea of being an author, you spend so many years writing a book and then, you know, you spend the next time trying to get people to read the damn thing. Um, you know, it's just like, give me a break. You know, 80% of a book success is your marketing plan, except everyone puts 80% into writing the book. 
and do diddly squat for marketing. I've been there, done it. So I know. So I'm much more interested in the idea of of what you just described is how to capture that pre wiki experience where you know people are coming together and collectively learning. Um, you know, and my shtick is equity moonshot, um, which is you know how to get people together and think about equity, regeneration, sustainability at multiple levels, uh, starting with their own personal experience, which was uh, what Klaus was talking about. How do you get into the world of somebody who may be, you know, um, you know, beige level or whatever, you know, how do you relate to them in a way that they, they see the point of coming together rather than getting locked into the divisiveness of, you know, climate change deniers, you know, proponents, yada, yada. So, you know, it comes back to the uh, Rodney King expression. Can we just get along? You know, give me a break. Can we just get along and, and do, do the work that we need to do? We're so good at sabotaging ourselves with our dysfunctional polarizations that actually that's one big, I'll just say this, I haven't mentioned this in a while, I don't think, but, you know, we're so locked into the language of values um, and we need to shift to the language of virtues. And I've said this before, but, you know, values divide us, virtues can align us. And the business world is so locked in to the language of, of uh, values, which are highly conflictual, that actual virtues can help us mediate across our differences in uh, value systems. So anyway, that's it. Over you, Jesse. Thanks, Rick. I actually had a conversation with my 17 year old son um, on that topic yesterday, and it became very heated. I would love to talk with you about it uh, another time, but um, he doesn't think it's possible. <laughs> which, which, which part? What, Sorry. The, the idea of virtues, uh, really having a, a group of people actually come together and um, work within a virtues framework versus um, talking about one opinion versus another. He just he doesn't see that as possible. So uh, another topic, another time to talk about and dive into, um, because that's really what I'm very much into what Jose was talking about. If that's the intention here in this group, I haven't yet experienced that in a way that I feel like I can lean in. It's more like I'm still trying to figure it out, you know, learning where, where's my place? What can I do? Um, so if we can move and sh uh, into that next level uh, somehow. I don't know what that looks like, but I'm I'm excited to explore that. Um, and I I just think that there's a the the collective authoring is one one level, but I I think it's the next step higher than that, and it's the collective action or something. I don't even want to use the wrong words. I but. would love for you to try to use the wrong words because I was about to ask <laughs> what, if, 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 if it's not collective authoring, what is it? I and mean, I it's not negating collective authoring. That's necessary as an ingredient to uh -huh. maybe the next step of action or working towards a, addressing a problem, not in isolation of all of our skill sets and all of our products and all of our offerings and all of our data. It just seems like it's, it's like I, I go into the computer every morning and I have all these dings from all these different platforms from Discord to LinkedIn. And I was talking, we were talking about this on uh, the call that Rick and I were on earlier with OpenXO, but it was weird that um, we're kind of m modeling that in our conversations too, in a way. It's a metaphor, but I, I think we're just kind of showing up the way that we know how, and we're reacting a lot to a lot of stuff. We're just kind of this, that, this, that, and our attention economy is is near null. It's just, are we really that productive going from this to that to this to that? So I don't know. I like to model here at least what that might look like next. And I look forward to it. I'm Jesse, thank you. Um I'm going to propose that next Monday our topic starts with the words collective authoring. And that we actually dive into what we mean by this and the, some of the nuances of what we've been talking about right now, I think would would like should we should turn this over um, so that we can figure out what language we do like together. I really love where you're going. And I'm realizing that a lot of decisions I'm making about what to do, what to call it, what to focus on, where to go are 
my own pragmatic interpretations about how the hell to get the word out about this this stuff that's actually fuzzy and hard to explain sometimes. Um, so I, I would love for us to pool our, our minds and uh, figure that out. It's, so does that sound like a reasonable topic for next week? Yeah, yes, if no? I could just if I could just quickly say one thing, Klaus, yes. we need to use spiral dynamics to think about neo books and what you described about collective authoring. I would say is the highest level. So there, maybe it's a teal approach to to thinking or something like that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, but I, and and I think that's actually an interesting perspective to bring into that con that conversation next Monday. Uh, mm. is, is how that would work. If I if I may just please please, there, there are two levels above. Uh, the threshold. One is yellow, one is teal. Teal is way out there. Yellow is practical. Yellow we can we can attain and achieve. You know, because with yellow you just become aware that there are ways to communicate based on different cognitive uh, frames. Teal means you're there, right? and it's you're the guru. <laughs> We're not, oh. So I don't. <laughs> that's right. So I'm clearly not the guru, you know, but I think I can think in yellow and I think you can aspire or you can work your way up to that. Um, thank you. Uh, Jose, you may have the last word here today. Yeah, uh, the so I'm not sure what you mean by collective authoring. In my mind, what I'm I unclear too, but go ahead. In my mind, what I was describing was less about, I think, I may miss a, have misunderstood what Pete was saying, I'm not, I don't, well, I've tried many, many times. I don't think we can write a single thing together. It's almost impossible. It's really, really, really difficult for a bunch of people collectively to write something together. What I, that lesson has been for me is maybe that's not the way we actually work together. That we go back to these little seeds and that we work with different seeds and assemble seeds together as building blocks to working together and building something. Not me and you and all of us writing together, but that each of us creates our own seeds and that others are encouraged and helped to use those seeds or fork those seeds and, and turn them into something that works for them, that they can grow something out of those seeds. So you're and describing that, the Neo book's vision. Like, and I, I don't know how we're not talking the same language, but you are, Pete, correct me if I'm wrong. You are squeaking in our language. Exactly. Which is great, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but you're not perceiving that we're doing that. Um, well, everything I've heard so far, does, hasn't felt that way. We haven't been. That's what I, I'm saying. We're writing a book. People are writing books. The book is big. The, the book is an external artifact to get people to do the thing you want. And right. that, may, what, that may be a wrong framing, which is a really good insight. But what I'm getting at is our conversation here, because I don't think we're talking to anybody outside, uh, as far as I know. Um, at the moment, in this conversation today, Everything we talked about was about certain people are writing certain books and their their books are going to be neo books. And it would kind of be like saying in the in the again, my language here in an um, open source community saying, I you write the whole stack and then we'll figure out how to build components for the stack. You go write the whole stack. And then once you've written the whole stack, we'll come back and we'll figure out how we're going to build uh, the components that allow us to build future stacks. Um, how do we that, go? That might be an, an artifact of the language that we're using or something like that. Yeah, that, that that's just what's resonating for me. And I may be yeah, thanks, completely Jose. wrong, but. Yeah. Um, I also have to say writing together, literally together, my word, her word, my word, her word. Um, is super easy. It's called peer programming. Super, super practical. Yeah. And and it doesn't have to be two people. It can be 10 people or 100 people. Um, it gets, and it we used to do it all the time. So it gets complicated. And that's what I, I'd love to sort of dip into that when we talk next week. I just like... I, it doesn't get complicated even. It, it's easier to write together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a, 
<laughs> so we're now slipping into next week's call. You know something I don't know. Thank yeah, you. exactly. Same here. Thank you all. This is really juicy. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Have a Thank good you. one. Bye. Bye. Bye.